Welcome to another wonderful episode of Success Innovation. Thank you for joining me. In this episode, we talk to America Rodriguez from Portland. We dive deep into the DACA and Dreamer situation and what she is currently going through with her current legal status. This episode was one of the most difficult up to date for me to actually talk to this individual. And it is very relevant to the political and economical situation. We will not get into the political in this episode, but I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Welcome back to another wonderful episode of Success Innovation. This is a first attempt to go ahead and do a Zoom interview. Uh, and we ran through some difficulties, technical issues, but I appreciate the patience of our guest today, who is America Rodriguez. She is a student from Portland, Oregon, and she was uh, she was she's actually a transfer from community college over into a university. So I'm gonna hand it over to America so she can kind of tell us a little bit about who she is and what she is doing at the moment. So America, welcome and thank you for being a guest here at Success Innovation. Thank you, Lazaro, for your introduction. And uh, yes, my name is America Rodriguez. I am currently a junior in civil engineering at Portland State University. And I completed my first two years over at a community college, Portland Community College here. Okay, all right. Um, and so you also mentioned that, you know, you're really, we met via LinkedIn. So that's how we connected. So I really appreciate this. And for students that don't know, LinkedIn is a really awesome tool because you can connect with individuals who are far away, not necessarily in your local area. And in this case, America, we connected and I asked her if we could do an interview and she graciously said yes. So we've been, we've been developing this uh, possibility for the last couple of months and we ultimately were able to agree and set a date. So thank you so much, America, for being able to do this today. Um, can you kind of share with us what experiences you've had so far as a community college student and now being transferred over to a university? So my experience over at my community college, um, I loved it. It was great. In high school, well, I went to a high school where a lot of students were uh, like from different, there, uh, the Hispanic community was really small. It was mostly white, Asians, and Indians. Where, in my place, we live super close to Nike headquarters and also Intel. So their parents, well, they're really educated people and they always want their students to be on top of their academics. Okay, all right. So, um, so you, mentioned, also, you mentioned you're a civil engineer, engineering student, yes. correct? Okay. Yes, How correct. and at what age did you find out that you wanted to pursue civil engineering? Well, you could have so, gone to um, any, you could have gone to any type of engineering, but at what age did you discover I want to do civil engineering? It was during my senior year of high school. Uh, I did in my high school we had electives. They had the engineering uh, courses, which I took all four years with the same professor where I had to take AutoCAD classes and also industrial arts classes. Okay. And he encouraged me to uh, go look into engineering. So after doing some research, I thought, um, I said, well, during was my pathway? Because I also took a lot of computer um, coding, like web design and game design. I understood the class, I got it, but I didn't see a future in sitting in the office, like. So you, you didn't see yourself sitting in the office coding or pursuing a computer career, correct? Correct. Because okay. I thought civil engineering is more like visual mm -hmm. and I have a variety of like being in and out. I'm not just in the same job. So what's the teacher's name so we can acknowledge who she is and, and give her a shout out so she knows that, that because of her, she introduced you to this wonderful world of civil engineering and that's how what what you're pursuing at this moment mm -hmm. his name is coach k so I coach. yeah coach k they call him coach k okay he was All right. a, Understood. Uh, 
like wrestling coach back then. So he now is a professor. And okay. Also. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So a shout out to Coach Hit. And he, he's, you know, he mentored you. Essentially, he was one of your mentors to pursue this path in civil engineering. So you were also, you also share with me that you're a member of SHIP and very active for that matter over in Portland. Can you kind of share with us at what age and how you discovered and came across SHIP? So I came across SHIP last year. So last year they hosted the RLDC in my university, Portland State University, mm -hmm. which I really wanted to attend, but then when I found out all tickets were sold, so I contacted them at my ship chapter and they signed me up as a volunteer, which I volunteer all three or four days. And okay, from there so I that's, met the ship that's, officers. That's pretty awesome. So let me, let me get this straight. You found out that the tickets were sold out and you didn't would give up. So that's an obstacle to overcome. And you went a roundabout way to actually say, hey, you know, I know that the tickets are sold out, but is there any way or any form that I can help out or do something? And that way you circumvented the situation and essentially you were able to get in as a volunteer. So you still partook in the event, but you volunteered. What came out of that participation as a volunteer? Well, as a volunteer, I, I got to meet a lot of the Region 1 uh, students. That includes Washington, Alaska, Oregon, and Northern California. Okay. So besides, and also I met my chip chapter here in Portland, which got me later engaged and made me become an officer this year. Okay. So even so before, even, even before being an officer, you participated as part of the Oregon uh, University SHIP chapter, right? Now that you're mm -hmm. in, no, you didn't. No. No, no so I this found was out the... like weeks. So okay. I was excited. There was actually a group called uh, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, which got me really excited about. So I was really upset that tickets were sold out, but I, I didn't mind volunteering. Why did why were you excited that that you discovered the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers? because uh, over in my school, I, in my classes, it's really rare to see another Hispanic in the class. Really? Okay. So so you felt that you could identify with this group of individuals, mm -hmm. and in particular, this society, which you know bluntly says Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers you're really like attracted to it from your perspective. This is something that I can relate to, exactly? Yes. Okay. Correct. All right, so from your interaction with this organization at your high, uh, at your level at this point, within what, a year span from what you've been saying, what has been the most beneficial aside from attending the RLDC in Region 1? Uh, I believe it was really empowering. I believe the theme was um, power from the past and force from the future. So I really uh, identified with that because it's a part of the past that drives you and to go forward. And you know, a lot of people don't want to be engineers because it's really hard. But um, people that are Hispanic and want to pursue an engineering career in our first generation, uh, what motivates them is mostly their family or their parents because mostly they're from uh, immigrant parents, which they have all sacrificed a lot of things for them. So, uh, so it was a really powerful quote. Right. So you mentioned immigrant parents and earlier you and I were talking about a situation that you're in. Your parents are obviously immigrant from what you told me, correct? Yes, correct. And you were not born in the United States, correct? Yes, correct. So you're coming from, where are you actually coming from? Uh, I was born from, I was born in Mexico and then I came over to U.S. Uh, because my parents brought me here to focus on my studies. Okay, so at what age did you come to the United States? Uh, I came at age when I was one, okay. but then my parents decided to send me back to go to elementary school to focus on my Spanish. And then after 
elementary school, I came back to Oregon to complete my middle school and high school. Okay, so you, you were born in Mexico and then you came here at the age of one, your parents decide for some reason to go back because they want you to learn Spanish and to go and experience the educational system over yes. there, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. And then at the age of about 10, 11, when you're just about to cross over to middle school, they decide to come over. So by that time, all your childhood essentially is lived in another country, Mexico in this case, and you're coming here and you're essentially a stranger to this culture because you didn't leave, you didn't live here, you didn't experience anything. So how was that transition for you? Uh, well, I'm really grateful I spent my childhood in Mexico because I did a lot of things. I was out running and hunting bunnies and snakes. Okay. So it was a really wild childhood. <laughs> okay. And um, I got to play with mud a lot. So I, I never had to play with video games or phone. I was out, out outside a lot. And also the school, uh, there was a lot of uh, people from low income because I live near the Tarumara tribes. So okay. you see uh, the indigenous people like struggling to uh, find food and all of that. So I think it made me grateful to be where I am now that I'm here in the U.S. And I see that a lot of people take their education and um, free things for granted because in Mexico, school is not free. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a good thing that you mentioned that education, some people take it for granted. So um, I'm going to dig a little bit here because I've heard a couple comments from individuals uh, across the internet saying that education college in this case is overrated that you know you don't need a degree to pursue higher a, a higher paying career and you don't need the degree to actually succeed in life to a certain extent that might be true but you're coming you're coming from from a different country, from a different culture, from a different background per se. And why are you pursuing an education? Why do you think that's important for you? And do you think that everybody that's putting education and saying that it's overrated is, is doing that? Um, well, I feel like people here in the US, they had, they had had their lives simpler and easier because they didn't have to go through all these struggles because in Mexico a lot of opportunities aren't offered but you have to create your own opportunities to succeed so it's a little bit harder in Mexico and here in the U.S. Uh, it's a lot of easier it's easier which people don't really mm, care I don't know right right so from my perspective, I think that everybody, every, the, at least Latinos in this case, or underprivileged individuals should pursue a higher education. Why? Because I, I come from a background where my parents didn't have a, a higher education per se, but um, my father said to me every single time that he had an opportunity, pursue a higher education. If you follow your footsteps in getting a higher education, you'll definitely be able to achieve things and doors will open up for you that I, I will never be able to show you and to share with you. For example, and this is something that I've told several individuals, when somebody asks you at a young age, what is your vision of where you see yourself working? What did I always envision myself doing? Well, I envisioned what I saw. I envisioned hard labor, hard work, physical activity, physical labor. I didn't really envision myself sitting in front of a computer or actually reading or writing letters and approving anything like that because my role model was actually seeing uh, the individuals doing hard work. I don't know what your take is on it, but if I asked you when you were about 10 years old, what did you envision yourself doing when you were 20 years or when you were an adult? What would you answer to that? Uh, well, my, my parent, my dad has also taught me the same thing and also told me the same thing. So when I was like 10, he will take me um, to go trim apple trees. 
during winter, right. which uh, the person that owns the apple trees, he's a university professor, and he would say, why do you want to um, bring your kids at 10? And during winter, when it's like snowing, it's like, oh, it's because I want to teach them uh, the value of an education. So right. once they have a degree, they don't have to be outside in the rain. Um, yeah. Instead of so, having a, a job in an office where they're warm. So, in retrospect, do you think that that was a valuable lesson? Uh, yes, of course. Okay. Okay. So now that you're studying civil engineering, Thanks. what do you see yourself doing in a couple of years? Or have you gotten any internships? Uh, what's your plan? Um, my plan, I'm... Because civil engineering has, well, at least in my school, has four sectors. It has transportation, structural, geotechnical, and environmental. So you get to pick one of those four or just go into general. And I'm looking into going to transportation or structural, either one of those. Okay. I'm assuming, I'm assuming that you see the value in obtaining an internship, but uh, is there any particular companies that you're targeting? Uh, right now, I did apply to uh, DR Horton, which they are a construction company that focuses in building homes and houses. And I applied to them because it's most of my uh, skills and experience that I have. I do a lot of uh, home remodeling as a side job. I do a lot of flooring, painting houses, fixing, the houses. Wait, wait, wait. You do, you do this on your own? Uh, yeah, I know all these skills. Oh, wow. Okay. So <laughs> is this is this like your own side business that you have? Is this with your dad? Is this with uh, other family members, friends, or my how dad. is this working? Your dad. So yes, your so dad, my dad is... does this as a side job. And then since I was little, he's been taking me to learn these skills. In the future, I don't have to hire anyone else there. To, to do work at your home or repair or anything, yeah. whatever. Okay, that's mm -hmm. awesome. So that's incredible. So it, because of those hands-on skills, have you actually, you can obviously talk your way through with anything when the interview comes about home repairs or remodeling and whatnot. So has have you seen that help? Um, yeah, I've seen it mostly. Uh, because on my resume, it has a lot of uh, work I've done for communities and organizations. I have volunteered as a Twitter coach. And yeah, and then besides that, I, they see I, I do a lot of home remodeling jobs, which they say it shows a lot of my personality. I'm a hard worker and, and also I'm a humble person. Wow. Awesome. Fantastic. So, um, you, you also mentioned that, well, you mentioned that you applied to, to this company here it, over in Portland, I think, and have they responded? What, what's, this, what's the situation there? Uh, I hadn't heard back from them, so. You, you have, excuse me? I hadn't heard back from them. You have not heard uh -huh. back from them, okay. Have you followed up with an email, phone call saying, hey, I'm still interested, just want to know what the process is, what my status is, and mm. they've not responded or you haven't followed up with them? Uh, both. Both, okay. Yes. And you also, and, and this is where it's going to get a little um, interesting, you mentioned that your status, your legal status here, it's, yes. it's not... It's not really well defined. Can you kind of go and guide us through that? Is that possible? Yes. So uh, right now I'm on, uh, living in the U.S. undocumented, which means um, I don't have a social security number or have uh, legal uh, re like permanent residence okay. in the U.S. So, so I'm not supposed to be here. So is, is, do you think that that is one of the reasons why some of the in some of the companies that you've applied to have not responded back to you. Yes. Yes. Okay. So. Um, is there any possibility that you can get some sort of document or student visa saying that you're 
you could be a potential candidate for employment? Um, I have a, an appointment with a lawyer in 10 days, so mm -hmm. I will check that out and see if I, is there any way I can fix my status and maybe get a yes. student visa right. so I can work legally and have it easier. So, but you, you are very ferocious and I applaud you and I acknowledge you for that because even though you've encountered so many closed doors or so many opportunities and people kind of, you know, give you a hint of hope and all of a sudden they learn about your situation, they kind of pull back, correct? Yes. So, but at, even, even at that point, you still pursue pushing forward. What keeps you driving forward? Um, what drives me forward is just finishing my career. <laughs> okay. Um, because I feel like right now it's more of an expectation for mothers. So I'll, uh, my story, it's been around for, I've told it in a few conferences and also Hermanas conference. So a lot of people have uh, looked up to me and reached out to me saying that i uh, they want to be like me. <laughs> right. So I just want to finish my uh, career to be a successful person and find a job that I like. Mm -hmm. And also, um, what else? Uh, Portland Community College just published my story in their magazine last year. So it was printed for over 90,000 copies and sent to all these students. Wow. Okay. So what was the reaction of that uh, community college community when they read that story? Or as a matter of fact, what happened and what did you experience after that um, article went out and was published? Uh, so first it was published on the uh, my community college website. So it was a feature story. And then months later, they reached out to me if they want to interview me for the magazine. And I said, yes. And then uh, months later, I see my magazine all in random places in different libraries at the airport. Wow. So, okay. How did you feel when was, you started seeing all of that happening? I just thought it was, I don't know, great. Right. <laughs> I, it was I great. saw my uh, work bus getting paid off. Okay. So has anything changed? Uh, at, from from before you actually had made that public to now that it's more public, has anything changed? Yes. Yes. So uh, I think I was like having this secret by myself. So after I released it, I just felt more uh, open about okay. it and more relief. Okay, more relief. Okay, more yes. open and more relief. Um, have have people actually reached out to you with a possible solution for your situation, giving you some hope, different type of avenue to actually approach it, or nothing like that? Um, not in that way, but people have reached out to me to um, give me, they gave me a scholarship, the Dreamers Scholarship over at PCC, and uh, they paid my last two terms of classes. Well, there you go. So something good has come out of that and, and being, you know, and, and well deserved because you're a, a persistent student, tenacious, and you continue striving forward. And to be honest with you, you had not disclosed this with me before we actually spoke tonight. So I, I had no idea. I mean, I knew that you were not from, from the United States originally, but I, I didn't know that you were an immigrant child, but I had no idea and I didn't really want to delve into uh, whether you were documented or undocumented until we kind of briefly spoke about it before we actually started recording. But I definitely want to thank you and applaud you for coming out and sh sharing it with me and the audience for Success Innovation, definitely for that. Um, and there's, to be honest with you, there's possibly a lot of individuals that are in the same situation as you. And as you said, living in the shadows is hard. If people see other individuals that are similar in a similar situation as they are, they feel more empowered, more encouraged, saying, hey, if she's doing it, if she's coping with it, I can definitely go ahead and cope with it and do something about it, at least move forward one day at a time. 
and it could definitely be a hard situation, but you're taking it so calmly from what I can see. I mean, what, what, do you stress over it or you don't? I, I, I was stressing over it. <laughs> okay. Because most of my classes are, um, and then engineering classes, they're mostly white males, older. So I didn't want to make it public because I knew they were going to read my story. And uh, I didn't want them to see that um, I, as I was taking away their opportunities. Right. And, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Take, you know, thank you for sharing that with us. And definitely, you know, it, it's something that's so, you, you kind of have to walk on eggshells, correct? You feel like, I got to be careful how I phrase this and I got to be careful what I say and I got to be careful on who I talked about this situation. So I definitely understand your fear and your hesitation to actually um, disclose this to a lot of individuals. Within your family, it's in your immediate circle of friends, it might be common knowledge. But outside of that, it is very difficult and very hard to share this and also for individuals to understand and grasp because it is a situation that is very common and a lot of people don't really understand it and they don't really want to understand. They only see one situation and one way of thinking and that's what they focus on versus having a more diverse and inclusive mindset. And I don't wanna really get into the political aspect of a lot of things, but I really want to commend you and I hope that your situation gets better. And I hope that somebody or some industry is able to find a finagle a way that you legally can become employed and that you legally can show and share the value that you are bringing to that corporation. So that would be amazing. So I want to ask a couple more questions of you. And this ones are going to be related to who you are as an individual. Do you have any mentors that you look up to? It could be anybody. It could be people or podcasts that you listen to, or it could be whatever you like. Mentors. I have some um, current mentors here at Portland State University, which is Dr. Tran, Joyce. Um, they are part of LSEP. Okay. What is, uh, what is LSIP? Uh, Lowest Stroke Alliances for Minority Participation. So it's for students of color going into STEM. Okay, so that is some sort of organization that is found within your university at this moment, correct? I believe Oregon, Washington, and Idaho have it. Okay, they have it. Okay, all right, great. So what what is that is amazing that is really cool what is something that you do hobbies or whatnot that is not required school work mm -hmm. a lot of people know this but i like riding motorcycles <laughs> you so like motorcycles riding motorcycles awesome what kind of a motorcycle do you have so I have a sports bike, a Honda CBR, and also a 800cc a Suzuki Bullet Bar. You have two. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Do you also do the repair on those maintenance, or or you take it to a shop? Uh, I just do the oil changes, but they don't require a lot of maintenance. Okay. Okay. So when you have to do anything with the brakes, you don't do it yourself, you take it to a shop? Yes. Okay, awesome. Okay, fantastic. Right, what is, did you actually learn how to ride a motorcycle? Uh, so when I was in Mexico, I will always see this motorcycle and I was, and I was like, I'm gonna get my motorcycle one day. <laughs> and then my dad, he bought me uh, pocket bikes, which mm -hmm. they're like miniature motorcycles that use gasoline, they're automatic. So I was riding since I was like maybe like five. And wow, then that's pretty cool. When I came to Oregon, I got my motorcycle endorsement like three years ago. Okay, okay. So is that your commuter vehicle or do you ride a car or mainly motorcycle? 
I ride a car. In Oregon, it rains a lot, so I just use it during summer okay. when I can. Okay. okay, all right, fantastic. Um, do you have any favorite books that you read uh, that are not required reading? Uh, so recently, I read a book uh, called My Underground American Dream by Ulyssa Arce. Okay. So also, I would consider her another people I look up to because she she has a similar story to mine. She came to the U.S. when she was like 12. She started middle school without knowing any English. She came to the U.S. with a uh, tourist visa, and then she had overstayed it. Okay. Okay. And so then after that, um, she applied to a lot of internships with a fake papers and fake social security numbers. Wow. Which so she, it's so so. At what age? At what uh, what uh, year did this uh, true story actually take place? Uh, the story took place in Texas, about uh, 2012. 2012. Okay, so it's not that long ago. It's about what uh, eight years ago, less than ten years ago, right? Yes. Wow, interesting. It's fairly. And then fairly... she ended up being a vice president for Golden Sachs. Oh Golden my Sachs. God. Okay, yeah. so it's based on the true story of a very successful individual that actually went up in the corporate ladder. Okay, so that's somebody you actually look up to. Okay, so. <clears throat> Hopefully that, you know, that, that happens to you. And then in the future, you can, I can say that, you know, I had America Rodriguez, who is a CEO of X company, was uh, before mm -hmm. undocumented and I actually interviewed her before she actually was able to get that job. So that'd be amazing. <laughs> Best of luck to you on that. Um, let's, uh, one, one other question that I do have. If you had a time machine, and you were able to, let's say, let's say your motorcycle was able to have the flux capacitor and you could actually put it in there, uh, whatever, whatever type of fuel, garbage or whatever. And you could definitely go back, let's say, how old are you right now? 21. You're 21. So let's say you went back 11 years to 10 year old America, That's right around the age where you were transitioning or coming over to the United States. I want you to share three pieces of advice with little America if you only had about two minutes with her and then you had to come back to our to our current year. What would you share with her? Three pieces of advice, things, lessons learned that you think are very important and that she would benefit greatly by hearing you say that. Mm -hmm. So in high school, I would, in middle school, I was considered like maybe the most quiet, quietest girl, the most quiet girl. Okay. So I would say not to uh, just be myself and not be afraid to talk, just be outgoing, get involved. Because I never got involved to any clubs or after school activities. Okay, and so that's one piece of advice. Get become more involved, become more active, and pursue different activities and or clubs within your school and organizations that are available to you, right? Yes. Okay. What is the second one? Second one will be um, not to stress about the classes I'm taking. I would say yes. Don't be afraid of the classes I'm going to take because I was taking the easy classes so I could get an ECA but back in high school I wish I could have taken like the hard physics classes and the calculus classes because your grades wouldn't really uh, mind they wouldn't really mind because you're not paying for your classes and you're learning okay so you would recommend that she be open to a challenge more receptive to actually pursuing harder things in life so that you can grow faster and get to where you're supposed to get with that much uh, challenges to offer. Okay, that's awesome. So what's the third piece of advice that you would share with your younger self? Mm, let's see. Yeah, just not to stress about anything. 
so everything just, is going to work out right. Okay. Eventually, so everything to, is going to be right. Uh -huh. Fantastic. So not to stress about things too much and to be, you know, to be not necessarily carefree, but to be receptive to go with the flow per se and to take life one step at a time, correct? Mm -hmm. And not to overstress yourself too. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so I definitely enjoyed really talking a lot with you and learning and getting to know you a little bit better. Learning and about your situation was something that I wasn't expecting to hear, but I think that our audience will be will greatly benefit from this experience and or reach out to you. If they want to reach out to you, is that okay with you? you know, I'll put the the email address that you provided me with so that they can reach out to you via email and also connect with you via LinkedIn. So we can definitely yeah. do that. Okay, fantastic. I have one last question at this point, at this point, and it could change. What is your definition of success? Um, <laughs> uh, my definition of success is uh, just being happy. Just being happy with yourself just finding the path that you're not like forced to get up to in the morning like not feeling like I me tengo que levantar <laughs> uh -huh. así perfecto like, sí sí una cosa no. que no saben de América she also is fluent in Spanish and that's something that I think that we didn't really touch on but I think is very important and she can attest to it I think that she's gotten a lot of benefit from being a, bi a bilingual, biliterate individual. Is that correct? Yes, correct. A lot of people that I, and the organi organizations that I participate in, I use my Spanish skills to recruit a lot of students and for them. Like on Friday, I am giving a workshop <laughs> in Spanish. Oh, wow, fantastic. That are undocumented, to, especially in Oregon, so they can see how they can apply and how they can go through their community college without paying anything. Fantastic. No, and that's amazing because I've, uh, you know, I definitely want to commend you for being a biliterate and not losing that language and utilizing it for the benefit of a good cause that you're doing really good uh, things. And I hope that you continue to doing this and to, to, to do that. And I do want to extend my, continued friendship and our relationship if you ever have anything and if you ever need uh you know advice in any sort of way form or shape you can definitely reach out to me america and that's that's uh something that i can definitely help you with and offer and we can definitely i'll definitely invite you to do more podcasts and more interviews and as a matter of fact we'll, you know we'll set something up to go ahead and talk about a specific topic and that would be more in depth to a certain subject. So I'll reach out to you and let you know what that is in the near future. Okay. Okay, Stephen. That okay. sounds great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank a lot, you. Marcelo. Thank you. Thank you, America. Is there anything else you want to add before we say goodbye? Como dice no, pónganse en las pilas. Pónganse las pilas. Pónganse en las pilas. Perfecto. So with that, to our audience of Success Innovation, I definitely want to say thank you. Thank you to our listeners and to our viewers. Once again, this is a first, this is an attempt to go ahead and do the, the Zoom interview. So we'll definitely, you know, this has been a wonderful experience for me. And I hope it's been a wonderful experience for our guest here, America Rodriguez from Portland. And definitely want to say thank you to her. And we'll be collaborating a little more in the future. So signing out, Lázaro Herrera from Success Innovation. Find the information for America. Bye -bye. Thank you for watching another wonderful episode of Success Innovation. I hope you found this episode of benefit. And if you did, please share with somebody that you think will benefit from it. Please connect with America Rodriguez via LinkedIn. You will find the connection in the description below. Once again, thank you so much for watching Success Innovation and or listening to the episode. I hope that you can recommend and subscribe other individuals and we can continue growing the community. I'll see you next time. Success Innovation, Lázaro Herrera. See you next time. Bye.